In this lesson, we'll have a closer look at HTTP response. HTTP response is the output of a web application. Most of the time, the responses are HTML pages, which we already know how to generate. But once in a while, we may have to create non-HTML content. So we need to have a better understanding of HTTP response. This is a request and response of my homepage captured by TCP IP monitor. We've discussed the request in the last in the last lesson. So let's now focus on the request on the right hand side. As we can see, just like request, a response also has three parts. The first line is called a status line. And then we have a number of headers just like in the request. And then there's the response body. Unlike request body, which is usually empty for get requests, the response body typically is not empty and it usually contains the web page requested by the browser. As you can see, this, this request body contains my home page. In the status line, there's the protocol, which again is HTTP 1.1. And then there's something called status code. Status code 200 here indicates that the request was processed successfully. Besides status code 200, you, you probably have seen some other status codes, most likely 404. And that indicates the requested page is not found on the server. And then sometimes you may have seen 401 or 403 errors. 401 meaning you try to access a page that's protected by a, by a password. And 403 means that you don't have the access privilege to access that page. And sometimes you may even see status code 500 indicating that there's some error on the server side. There are many status codes defined in the HTTP standard, and they are organized into groups. Status codes between 100 and 200 tell the clients to perform further action. 200 to 300 means the request is successful. 300 to 400 means the resource has moved. 400 to 500 means there's an error and it's caused by the client. And 500 to 600 means the error is caused by the server. The 300 calls means the requested resource has been moved to another location, and when a browser receives a 300 response, it immediately sends another request to the new location, and this is called a redirect. Due to historical reasons, the implantation and interpretation of three 300 calls are a bit messy. There is a section in the textbook that talks about this situation. Check it out if you are interested. We don't really need to worry about this in our class since we never set status code directly. Just know that when you call the method response send redirect, it sets a status code 302 in the response. Another thing related to status code is error page. An error page is a page displayed when an error happens. Application servers will typically provide default error pages. So, for example, let's say that we start our project. And let's say we click on a link and it goes to hello world and it shows this. And uh, let's say we, if we try to access a URL that is not handled by a servlet or a static resource, and uh, this is a error page and notice that this error page is automatically generated by Tomcat. Now the problem with uh, application server generated error pages is that uh, it looks quite different from the rest of your web application like this one. So it kind of uh, 
give your web application an inconsistent uh, look and feel, which is not uh, good for professional websites. And also, notice that uh, automatically generated error pages may have some information that you don't want to show to the user. For example, here it shows the server type and the version number. You probably don't want to show this information to the users because some malicious users may want to hack into your website based on the information that they see from this type of error pages or some other similarly, similarly auto-generated pages. So to replace those automatically generated error pages, all you need to do in Java EE is to create your own page and then specify it in the web.xml file using the error code and the page. So for example, let's say we want to create a 404 error page that uh, will be displayed to the user when a page not found error happens. Now, we can place the page under this special folder, webinfo. This is a special folder in Java web applications where you can hide certain resources from the direct access by the remote users. So 404 error page, for example, you probably don't want the user to directly see. So we can hide it under this webinfo folder. And uh, we just need a very simple HTML page. I'll call it 404. And uh, let's say the title is 404 page not found. And uh, we'll say the page you requested is not on this server. Something like this. So once we have that page, we just need to specify it in web.xml. And uh, that's as simple as, oops, as simple as putting an additional element in there. And uh, notice that in this error page element, you specify the error code. And now we know that it's basically the status code that will be set in the response. And then you specify the location on the error page. In here is 404.html. And this should do it. Now let's restart our project. Hello world, and then hello world two. So we're not seeing the error page here because the embedded browser in Eclipse uses the rendering engine of Internet Explorer, and uh, IE will automatically display its own 404 page when it sees a status code. So it kind of ignores the response body of our HTTP response if it sees 404 status code. But if we do this in a different browser, like Firefox, and here you can see that Firefox actually displays the response, uh, the, error the error page that uh, returned by the, uh, by the server. So IE has, I guess, its own you know, quirky behavior. Okay, so this is about the using error pages in Java web applications, and it's pretty straightforward to do. For status calls, for this class, uh, obviously you don't have to memorize uh, you know, all the HTTP status calls, but uh, do remember a few commonly used ones. And uh, knowing some of these status calls will make debugging a bit easier because sometimes uh, when you look at the status code, you can immediately tell what went wrong. And also, although you don't have to remember the individual status codes, you do need to remember the status code ranges so that uh, when you look at a status code, at least you have some general idea of what it is about. 
and uh, that's about it for the status calls. And then we have the headers. Lots of the response headers have their counterparts in request headers. For example, this accept request headers tell the server what types of content the browser is capable of process or receive. And this This content response headers tell the browser about the content of the actual response sent back sent back from the from the server. Most of the time you don't have to set response header directly. For example, when you call the method response send redirect, the method will set the location header for you to tell the browser where where the where it is redirected. However, once in a while you may have to set a response header yourself. We'll see a couple of examples later to see how to use the refresh header and the content disposition header. Just like request, Java encapsulates HTTP responses in a class so we can access different parts of a response using method calls. Again, after class, please take a look at the API documentation and get an idea of what methods are in there, what you can or cannot do with them. Lots of response methods still deal with headers. For example, add a header, add a header of certain type, check if a header exists or not, and so on. And there are a few response methods that are used quite often. We've already used set content type and send redirect in our examples. And then you have get writer and get output string. We know that in Java, writer is used to generate Textual, text, textual output, like uh, in this case, the HTML pages. And the output stream is used to generate binary output. And we can use this to send, for example, images back to the, to the, to the, to the client. We'll, ex we'll see an example later that uses get output stream. Now let's do some examples. We'll start with a simple one, which is the add example that we did before. So remember that in this example, we have a servlet that has two request parameters. And uh, the first parameter, let's say, is a and 10, and the second parameter is b, 20, and it shows the sum of a and b. Right? And uh, we also created a web form, and we can use that to provide the parameters too. So if we go to add form and we say a is 100, b is 25, and then we send a request with 125 to the servlet, and it shows the result here. Now, if we look at the servlet, we notice that Current implementation assumes that there will be a request parameter a and a request parameter b, and uh, both of them will be integers and so on. So what if the user only provide one parameter? For example, let's say this user forgets to enter the value for b and then click add, and now we have a they have an error here, right? And uh, the error says uh, for input string, empty string, it cannot be converted into a integer. And uh, that error happens here at line 29. And uh, it's basically integer pass int and uh, b, is, uh, b is actually not now, it's an empty string. Okay, so how do we 
deal with this situation. And uh, let's say that uh, what we want to do is we first want to check if A or B is uh, empty or not. And if it's empty, we redirect the user back to this add form. And uh, otherwise, we continue as before. So let's do this. We'll say we first want to check whether A and B is empty. So I'll say if A is null or B is null or A is not null but it's an empty string. So how do we check for empty string? We can do a trim and uh, after trim we check the length of the string is zero or not. And uh, similarly we do this for B. And uh, if this if this is the case, we do a response and uh, redirect, and uh, we will redirect the user to the add form.html. Here is whether the lens would be there. Something like this. So let's run this code. And then we go to add form. And uh, again, we enter 100 and uh, forget about B and add. Now, unfortunately, if you look at the, the result, it doesn't seem to do anything. Even though we added a if statement here, it still says for input string, empty string, and then there's an error at line 33 this time. And uh, 33 is here, and again, the error is this part. Now, this may look kind of weird because uh, we obviously we obviously have checked the input and uh, if it's an empty string it should have caught the input here right and then it should uh, send the user to add form so what happened here now what happened here although it's not immediately obvious it actually makes sense if you understand uh, what uh, this send redirect method does now what this method does is it will set a status code in the response and uh, that status code will be 302 and then it will set a location header to the new, to the url add form what this method doesn't do, however, is that it doesn't terminate the execution of the whole method. So what's happening here is that this if condition is checked and uh, this send redirect method will be caught. But uh, after that, the code will continue to execute because send redirect does not terminate the execution of the whole method. So in order to do that, we'll have to add a return statement and the return statement will actually terminate this method and then the response will be sent back without this return statement it will continue to execute although the if condition is met and uh, this is a fairly common error so <coughs> excuse me <coughs> that's why i want to start it with this example now with that return statement, this time it should be OK. And uh, then let's go back to, for example, add form.html and uh, 100 add. So notice that this time we are sent back to here. Send back to here again, and how about we enter both A and B, and now it's working correctly. So the example is really pretty simple. 
the main point here is that uh, remember send redirect does not terminate the execution of the current method. You need a return statement to do that. Now the next example is an example I want to show you how to set a response header yourself. And in this case, we are going to set a, set the header refresh. And this header tells the browser to automatically refresh the display every certain number of seconds. And uh, it's quite useful for certain type of web applications. For example, if you want to create a web application that uh, shows the stock prices and uh, for typical web application, the user has to manually click refresh in order to send a, a new request to the server to retrieve the updated information. Now to display stock prices, which changes all the time, you obviously don't want your users to manually click a refresh button themselves. And uh, so what you can do is you can set this refresh header so the browser automatically refreshes instead of the user having to do that manually. Now, I'm going to call this example countdown. So let's say it will count down for from 10 to 0 and then you know, do something. So let's uh, create that example and uh, we'll create a servlet. I'm going to call it countdown. And uh, for this one, for this one, let's just use to get. So we'll create a counter again, and this time the counter starts with 10 and then let's do the display so here we will say if the counter hasn't reached zero, we'll set a refresh header and then decrement the counter. If the counter is already zero, just display a message. Okay, so that means if counter is already zero, we simply display a message that says something like uh, rocket launched. And uh, if it's not zero, not zero what we do is we display the counter and then we set a response header set header and the header we are going to set is called refresh and the value we are going to set it to one that means the the browser should automatically refresh after one second if it's two it means two seconds and so on and then we 
I could make the counter. And uh, let's see if it works. Okay, it's indeed working, and uh, notice that I'm not uh, clicking on the refresh button myself, and uh, the mouse cursor is here. It, the browser automatically refreshes based because of the refresh header, and uh, when the counter reaches zero, it no longer sets the resp response header here, so that the the browser stopped uh, refreshing. So this is a simple example, and this example just to show how to manually set a response header. You don't have to do this most of the time, but for certain type of uh, special scenarios, you might need to do this. And uh, we can set a header as simple as specifying the header name and then the value, and that's it. Now, the next example I want to show is how to use, how to generate a binary response. So far, we've seen examples where the, where the HTTP response is an HTML page. We use a get writer and then print and that's that. But once in a while, you may need to generate a binary or non-text response, like an image. So in this example, we want to use a servlet to send the image back to the client. Now, let's say we want to do that with this image, banner.jpg. It's an image that we used as a banner image for, for CSNS. Now, you could simply put this image, for example, under web content. If we, if we put it there, we can simply access that image as banner.jpg, right? And we see the image here. And uh, if that's all you want to do, there's no need to you, to write a servlet for that because uh, this can be this can be considered as a static resource by the application server, and the application server can simply serve this image without you having to write any code. However, sometimes you may want to do more than just displaying this image. For example, if uh, you want to implement a web application that, for example, counts the number of times a user has uh, downloaded an uh, image, and uh, you obviously cannot do that if uh, the image is served directly by the application server. Also, for example, if you want to create an online album, and uh, each user should have their own album for their own images or pictures, and uh, you don't want everybody to be able to access everybody else's pictures, for example. So you need to build some security into it. And again, if you just let the application server to serve those images, there's no way you can add the security or anything else for that. So let's say that in this case we want to we want to use a servlet to serve this image so that we can later on build some additional functionality like counting the number of downloads, adding security and so on into it. So instead of putting the image in a place where it can be directly accessed we simply leave this image here, outside, in fact, outside the workspace of my project. This obviously is not a location that the user can access directly. So if they want to access this image, they have to access it through our servlet. And uh, then let's create that servlet. So I'm going to call this servlet download, which means that we are going to use it to download the image. 
and uh, what we need for this image just to get i think okay So sending back an image fundamentally is really not so different from sending back an HTML page. All we need to do is we read the image from disk and then write the image to the response. And uh, that's more or less it. So how do we read the image? And uh, if you remember your Java stuff, you know that uh, there's a there's a number of classes that you can use in the Java I/O package, and uh, here we have file input stream, file output stream, file reader, file writer. Because an image is a binary file, we know that uh, we can use an input stream, and uh, that's it. So if you look at file input stream, you can specify the path to the file as a string to create an input stream, and then you can read from that input stream. Notice that there are really not that really not that many methods in this class that you can use. You can basically read a byte or read a number of bytes, and that's more or less it. And uh, the recommended way is to create a byte array and use that to read the binary file. And uh, typically, you would want a byte array of 2K or 4K, uh, 4K bytes, something like that. So the way it works would be something like this. We create a file input stream. And uh, we specify the location of the file which is on c drive under courses c320.banner.html so it will be c courses c320 and then banner.jpg And to read that, we create a byte array. We'll call it buffer. And uh, this byte array, let's say, will have 2K bytes in it. And uh, the size of the file is not exactly a multiple of a 2K. So at the beginning, every time we do a read, it will read all read two uh, k bytes into this array. But the last read, when we reach the end of the file, is uh, likely to have less than two k bytes left. So, what this method read does is it returns an integer, which uh, which is the total number of bytes read into the buffer. So it will try to read as many bytes as it is. It will try to read the number of bytes that uh, it equals to the length of the buffer. But uh, at the end of the file, it may be less. So we have to check this one. And uh, it will return minus one if there's no more data left. Okay, so we'll do something like this. We'll create a integer called bytes red, and then we'll say, well, bytes red is read bytes, and uh, if it's greater than zero, meaning that if it's not minus one and uh, then we want to write this write the bytes read into the buffer into the response so for that of course we need the 
we need to get output string. So we'll say output string is response dot get output string and uh, we'll say output string. So if we look at the documentation for output string, it has again only a few a few methods about uh, writing bytes. So you can write uh, all the bytes in an array, or you can write all the bytes in an array up to a certain number of bytes. And this is what we are going to use because we don't know whether the buffer is filled especially when it gets to the end of the file. So what we do is we can say out.write and we're going to write the buffer starting from zero and uh, whatever number of bytes actually were read from the file. Something like this. And uh, this is actually more or less it. Now after we reach the end of the file and uh, write it out to the response. We can close the input stream. We don't need to close the output stream for the response. The, it's uh, automatically done for us by the application server. We do need to close the input stream for the file that we out opened. And also, we would want to do a set content type because now the content is no longer HTML. It's going to be, if I remember correctly, image.jpg. So yeah, let's try this. Okay, so again, IE probably doesn't like the content type image, JPG. Let's try this with Firefox. With Firefox. So download. Yeah, so Firefox shows this image just fine. And uh, now, this is more or less it when we want to generate a generate binary response. So first of all, set the correct content type. And then secondly, use output stream instead of writer to write the, to generate the response. And uh, as long as you know how to use output stream and input stream, it's pretty straightforward to do. Now there's a minor thing here, which is related to file name. And uh, if we want to save this image, for example, notice that the file name shows as download.jpg. Uh, the reason is pretty simple because the URL says download and uh, the date, the content type is JPG. So the only possible file name that uh, this browser can use would be download.jpg. Now let's say that we want to do a little bit better than that. We want to tell the browser what is the actual file name. And uh, notice that uh, there's really not much you can use to convey that information to the browser. Right? You have uh, your response, which contains status code, headers, and then the uh, response body, which is uh, for the actual file itself. So in order to somehow tell the browser, you need to probably use it as a header. And that's indeed the case. So this content disposition header is something that you can use to tell the browser, first of all, what the file name, and secondly, how to handle the file, whether to 
download it or just display it. So let's say that we add that header. We'll say response uh, set content. No, not set content, set header. And the, the header is called content disposition. And uh, then let's say we'll do uh, attachment. File name is planner.jpg. So if we do that, let's run this. Uh, if we go to this URL again, now notice that this time Firefox pops, pop, pops up a dialog window asking us to save this file instead of displaying that file directly in the browser. And uh, that's because of the attachment value that we set for content disposition header. And uh, also know that it's now correctly getting the actual file name banner.jpg instead of generating something called download.jpg. And uh, that's the second part of the content disposition header where we say file name. Right? And uh, then we can save this file and of course uh, we can also say instead of attachment, if we can also say inline. And uh, if we refresh, or let's see, if we go to that URL again, notice that now the image is displayed directly in the browser. And uh, that's because we say that this file should be displayed in line. And uh, if we right click and save image, again, it's getting the correct uh, file name here. So for this example, there are several things. How to do file I.O. in particular binary file I.O. Set content type, which is particularly important if you are generating non-HTML response. How to do binary response and how to set or use the content disposition header. So this is about it regarding HTTP responses. Unlike HTTP requests, there's not too much, too many tricks that you can do with HTTP responses. You need to know the basic format of an HTTP response, like a status line, status calls, headers and so on, and uh, you need to know also how to generate the non-HTML responses, and uh, that's more or less it. So that's the end of the, this lesson, and uh, see you next time.